ערב טוב, צהריים טובים, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great honor for me to open uh, this uh, lecture in uh, memory of Judah Eisenberg. I had the privilege of uh, learning physics from Judah as a graduate student. It was one of my best experiences as a student in this university. And Judah's example as a teacher and a colleague later on has always been something I very much cherish. And today we are very happy to have as our speaker, uh, Professor Larry McLaren uh, from Brookhaven National Laboratory. Um, I will uh, first ask Professor Avraham Gal from Hebrew University to say a few words in uh, Judah's memory. And uh, later we will continue with uh, a ceremony of awarding a fellowship in Judah's name, and then we will move to the scientific part of this afternoon. Please. Shabbat Eisenberg, Nili Akara, then Rabbi Mishu, Meir Mishpacha Yishno. When I came earlier today, all of a sudden I caught myself asking, uh, why did I come almost a full hour before? Was it to evade traffic jams? Or perhaps as years ago when I used to come to discuss physics with Judah, I would come uh, to have some extra time and we would just walk. Walking and hiking and exchanging views was one of our joint pleasures. And I still miss him, uh, not only for his physics, but also for the lots of cultural activity that was developing during those walks and hikes. Judah was born in 1938 in Cincinnati, the USA. His family moved uh, soon to New York, to Forest Hills, suburb of New York City. He studied in Columbia, and later he did his PhD under Kerson Huang in MIT. Judah was fluent in Hebrew and Jewish culture. He was perhaps the only person that I recall uh, when talking to him, I had to take guard how my Hebrew sounds and how I use it. He got full round education in Judaism because the tradition of his family, the profession of his father, and he was ripe uh, in the 60s uh, and in the beginning of the 70s to make Aliyah. I think that this decision to come to Israel to settle and to assume a professional career in Israel uh, brewed with him for a long period uh, over the 12 years that he served as first assistant professor in Charlottesville, rising up through all ranks to become chairman around the age of 30 years old. And, uh, when he was ripe for that, right after the Yom Kippur War, he came uh, with a uh, fact-finding mission of a uh, U.S. professor for peace in the Middle East to Israel, and he made a tour. And I remember that day in December 1973, when looking over Jerusalem from the terrace in my home, he said, I think I wish to get an offer. And from that point of on, it was just a race between Aviv Yavin and myself. Luckily for you, people in Tel Aviv, I was junior at that time. I didn't have this, that influence. And moreover, Aviv had one big advantage. He had a young experimental group uh, with him that attracted Judah. And I think that this was one of the decisive factors that Judah went to Tel Aviv. He spent the year of 74, 75 in Jerusalem, and he made started lots of collaboration with Victor Mandelsweig, with myself, with other people from outside. And then he moved in 75 to Tel Aviv. He was already a recognized leader in pion nuclear physics. In fact, uh, his entry to pion physics occurred a couple of years before the seminal paper of the two Ericssons in 1966 that defined the framework of multiple scattering of reactions in low energy pyonuclear systems. And he was uh, organizing workshops 
and leading informal groups in Los Alamos, later in Vancouver, also uh, one summer in Brookhaven, Larry, a uh, long time before you came there. And uh, between the years, I would say, 63 and 1986, he was one, perhaps, of three or five leaders of intermediate energy physics, notably pyronuclear physics. His works are well known in that field. And then, typically, he moved to a more novel uh, field, a field where he would apply his method for dense and exotic matter using uh, back reaction, uh, pair creation, and skermions. Skermions were his real love together with his ex-student, Zvi Kalberman. He worked a lot on developing models of skermions and checking what effects they could lead uh, in hadronic physics. Judah, unlike many of newcomers to Israel, uh, developed a public career. His uh, fluency in Hebrew, his grasp of historical and political processes enabled him very quickly to assume a role of leader. And so he rose it in the Tel Aviv University hierarchy to become a dean and later to become vice rector. And if it were not for his untimely death in 98, he would become a rector and perhaps even assume higher positions. His loss, his loss, his loss is a loss for every one of us, for the Tel Aviv uh, School of Physics, to the Israeli nuclear physics and hadronic physics community, and to his many friends. As I said, I mourn his death also from a personal perspective. I miss uh, the long walks with him, the chats with him, and in later years when he would become uh, very uh, busy with administration, and I would call him on phone, he would like to tell me something, but he didn't have time to, he would say, well, let's leave it to the desert of Judea. I think uh, this is a good tradition, and I would stop here leaving the many memories that I carry for Midbar Yehuda. I would like to mention that uh, today's speaker, Larry McLaren, uh, knew Judah very well. I'm sure he'll say a few words about it. Uh, my last uh, long acquaintance or meeting with Judah uh, on a personal basis was on a trip that nearly Judah and I had together, the three of us, to South Africa in '96, and Larry was there too. This was a beautiful meeting in a place called Paradise uh, on the Indian Ocean. And uh, so Larry belongs to this community. He came from high energy physics and he moved into dense and exotic matter. He came to Brookhaven and he was leading the nuclear theory group which went through big metamorphosis and uh, expanded and became one of the major groups in nuclear physics in the US and worldwide. Uh, so thank you for your attention. I would like to invite now uh, Mrs. Neely Amit and uh, the head of School of Physics, Professor Ellen Oz, uh, to the award ceremony of a fellowship uh, to an outstanding graduate student. Where are you? Ido Adam. Here is Ido Adam, who is a graduate student in theoretical high energy physics in string theory. And we are happy to uh, have this tradition of giving these fellowships to best graduate students every year. And it's a heavy burden, you know, people who got it in the past have done very well. So, please. I wanted to take this opportunity to personally again to thank Larry for coming. As Avram already mentioned, we've known each other for many, many years and always such occasions when uh, the lecturer is actually somebody who knew Judah, who was his friend. It uh, sort of means a lot to me and uh, 
I can welcome him personally. And I also I wanted to thank all of you, all the physics department, because uh, when I see you, I don't need to tell you about Judah, who he was, uh, because for all the other places, even at the university, for people who knew Judah, except those that were our close personal friends, uh, they, they don't remember him as well as you guys, and they don't know what really was in Judah that was so special and so unique. So uh, whenever I'm among physicists, I, I feel that you, you can identify with, with our loss, with my personal loss and the loss of the family much more than anybody else. And uh, Shimon Yankelovich is not here, but I also wanted to thank Shimon, first of all, for maintaining the rector's lectures uh, in Judah's memory, but also Shimon was the person that was so instru instrumental in um, creating this scholarship in Judah's name. So, um, I'll also, of course, I'll take the opportunity to thank him personally, but I thought it was nice to mention that it was really his doing. Thank you very much. So at this point, uh, we end the uh, ceremonial part of our afternoon, and uh, we will make a three-minute break. And then we will start with the scientific part, where we will hear a, a lecture by Professor McLaren. So we make a short break, maybe even less than three minutes. Let uh, the people, there are some people who must be uh, in other places at this time. And so so uh, once again, I, I am very glad that our speaker today is Professor McLaren. Uh, I have personally known him for a very long time and uh, always enjoy discussing physics with him. Uh, he is uh, currently uh, the head of the RICAN theory group at the Brookhaven National Laboratory dealing with uh, matter in extreme conditions which are being recreated at the, the Brookhaven Accelerator. Professor McLaren obtained his PhD from uh, the University of Washington in Seattle, later uh, was a postdoc in SLAC and MIT, at MIT and he was at the University of Minnesota also, and is currently, as I said, in Brookhaven, where he is uh, indispensable in providing the theoretical guidance uh, in these times, which are very exciting, as you would hear. There is a lot of exciting data, and a lot of theoretical wisdom is needed, and uh, I think uh, they are very lucky to have you there to help them sort it out. So uh, we're eager to hear you now. Thank you. Okay, can people hear me, I guess? Uh, yeah, um, I first met Judah when I was visiting the University of Frankfurt many years ago. Uh, we shared an office together. Uh, we were office mates. So. Judah was a person who was remarkable to me because he was uh, one of these rare people who was absolutely honest and filled with kindness, okay? He was also a person who, uh, by a series of coincidences or whatever, uh, uh, hired some very good friends of mine into his group, like Ben Svetitsky and like later Lonia Frankfurt. And he also, was also at a department of people who have always been very good friends of mine, who I like very much. And uh, he's a kind man, a nice man. And I remember very much the time we had together in South Africa in uh, in, um, and one of the things which we did together was uh, we, uh, uh, Judah, Nelly, and I, and a bunch of other people went on a long hike into the, uh, on the inland mountains near the coast up to a waterfall and had just a wonderful time talking about all sorts of things. Uh, we didn't talk about physics much, but we had a nice, really a nice day. He was a very nice man. In, in this talk, Part of the talk uh, is, is about some topics which are related to things which Judah thought about 
and did some work on actually Judah and Ben and uh, did some critical work on and I'll try to make relations to that when we get to that part of the talk. So let me begin. Um, okay. Uh, what, what, what are the questions I want to try to address in this talk? Uh, basically three questions. One is what is the high energy limit of QCD? Another is what are the possible forms of high energy density matter? And how do quarks and gluons originate in strongly interacting particles? That is, how do you calculate the distribution functions of quarks and gluons in strongly interacting particles? And the best way I know of getting into this subject is to do it qualitatively through art. Art and metaphor has advantages in science and disadvantages. One is it's visual and intuitive. The other problem is it's very subjective. But the subjective nature of art is very useful at times because, as we know, theoretical ideas change as a function of time. And sometimes the words and concepts we use, and even the mathematics which we use, metamorphizes into different ways of thinking about problems as time evolves. And art has that property very strongly. But in any case, it provides a useful way of thinking about what we're doing. This is a picture of a heavy ion collision. We begin with a color glass condensate. It makes some thermally equilibrated matter, quarks and gluons, the quark gluon plasma, and then expands and eventually produces particles which go out in a detector. And this is a picture of a distribution of particles which is seen in the uh, star experiment. I'll call that the little bang. The big bang is, of course, the big bang. There you have an initial singularity, inflation where the universe expands very rapidly. It eventually thermalizes. Matter is, uh, and density fluctuations in matter are generated, uh, which eventually are seen in the form of distributions of galaxies and ultimately, hopefully, will be seen in the distributions of dark matter in the universe. These things have a formal similarity in that one's talking about expanding matter. And in fact, there are actually some mathematical singularities with what happens early on in the collision and what happens early on in the Big Bang. And in fact, some of the things you look for experimentally are related to the things which you look for experimentally in the Big Bang. But it's metaphor and it's art and it serves as an introduction to the way we think about these problems. Here's another set of artwork. This, this piece of artwork is due to my friend Tetsuo Hatsuda at the University of Tokyo. This one's due to my friend Stefan Bass at Duke University. This picture is two nuclei approaching one another, which I'll call a color glass condensate. And I'll define what I mean by that later in the talk. They collide. And when they collide, I'll call that the initial singularity. That's sort of the tip of the light cone in this picture, which isn't shown. And then after they collide and this initial singularity evaporates away, one has plasma, which eventually forms a strongly interacting quark gluon plasma, which eventually makes a hadron gas, and the hadrons go off to detectors. I'm not going to talk about these two latter stages of the collision. I looked at the history of this, lecture, of this colloquium series before I came, and there have been talks about this, and I'm sure this has been talked about. This probably maybe has not been so much talked about in colloquia, unless Jenya uh, gave a colloquium on it. You did, Jenya? No, shame on you. You don't advertise our work. Here's another way of thinking about this, which is maybe a little more mathematical. Here are the initial nuclei going along lines with t is equal to z and t is equal to minus z, two thin sheets which are along the light cone. They hit at t equals z equals zero. That's where the initial singularity is. The initial nuclei is a color glass condensate are thought of as coherent high energy density gluons. The initial singularity, at least at very, very high energies, will be a singularity. And it will look somewhat like an event horizon from which there are quantum fluctuations which bear some formal similarity to Hawking radiation evaporate. And this matter as it's expanding, which has been produced at this singularity, I'll call glasma because it's somewhere in between a color glass condensate and a quark gluon plasma. But I will have to justify to you why this is qualitatively different than what precedes it and what uh, follows it. And I'll do that. And then finally, there's the quark gluon plasma, about which I'm not going to spend much time talking. Uh, this picture has a strong correspondence with cosmology, but there are ideas and words in here which aren't really the kinds of words that you use in cosmology. 
So the question you have to ask are how can ideas be tested, ideas about strong interactions or more generally about field theory, and what are the new physics opportunities which you can find in this environment? I always find I'm walking to the screen because I first time I've used one of these fancy mouses which work from a distance. Here's a picture of a hadron at very high energies. Here's what happens in a detector. This is a Phoenix detector. This is a star detector. This shows that in these collisions, lots and lots of particles are produced. Thousands and thousands of particles from a few hundred nucleons in the initial collision. How do they get produced? Well, they get produced because in the wave function of this nuclei, there are lots of gluons. Now you say, that sounds silly, because I know that a quark nu nucleus is made of nucleons, and a, and a nucleon is made of three quarks. But that's not really true. Sometimes it's made of three quarks. Sometimes it's made of three quarks plus one gluon. Sometimes it's made even of three quarks and lots of gluons. There are lots of different states of this wave, wave function of a hadron. Its wave function can be decomposed into states which have three quarks and very many gluons in it. And it just happens that in high energy collisions, the states which have three quarks and lots of gluons in it are the important ones for these scattering processes. It's also true that if you think about this in a frame where the nucleon moves very fast, this nucleon looks like basically a wall of gluons. Now, this picture is perfectly Lorentz invariant. I'm not saying that if I Lorentz boost this part of the wave function, I get this. It's just that when I study high energy processes, it's this part of the wave function which is important for those high energy processes. Perfectly Lorentz invariant picture. Um, in fact, if you, count, if you measure the number of gluons as a function of the ratio of the energy of the gluon, the total energy of a hadron, in a frame where the hadron's moving very fast, it actually rises very, very rapidly as x gets smaller. That's called the small x problem in high energy physics. Actually, it should have been called the high energy problem, okay? Because you see, if you fix the energy of the gluon at some scale, like a strong interaction scale, and you make the energy higher and higher, the minimum of value of x gets smaller and smaller. So what you really see is that the high energy limit of strong interactions is a limit where there are very, very many gluons inside a hadron. And this causes, naively, a problem. Because we all know from measurement, no theory, just from experimental measurement, that the total cross-section over very, very many orders of magnitude barely changes at all. So what do you do with all the gluons? Okay. They have to keep fitting into the same size hadron, and they're going to get squeezed. And in fact, what happens is kind of amusing. If you try to pack more and more gluons of the same size into this disk, at some point they'll all be pushing on one another and you can't fit any more in. Okay? And really what happens is you have to put a order one over alpha strong of these gluons into this disk because only when you pile one over alpha strong on top of one another do they interact with strength one because alpha strong times one over alpha strong is the order one. So they act like hard spheres. Um, I should say the coupling constant gets small because the density of gluons is becoming very, very large. So it makes sense to talk about this in weak coupling theory. But now you can see what happens as you go to higher and higher energies. You fill up this disk with uh, little balls of some fixed size. You want to add in any more? What do you do? You have to add in smaller ones. So you add them in between the holes, between the big ones. They get all filled up, and then you have to add in smaller and smaller ones. Okay, so what does this picture tell you? You say, well, why is he saying this? Well, what it's really saying is when you use quantum mechanics, the typical size of these gluons is related to their transverse momentum inversely. Small dots have big transverse momentum, have big energy. So as you go to higher and higher energies, of course you fill things up first, which have the largest size, which have the smallest energy. Then you add in more and more high energy ones and more and more high energy ones. And you get this funny picture of saturation. Saturation is not the statement that you keep adding gluons to this thing and the number of gluons just stop rising. It's the statement that gluons of fixed size stop increasing as you go to higher and higher energies. You can always add in more and more gluons. So the high energy limit is a limit of very, very many gluons inside the hadron. And the gluons up to some fixed size are filled up as much as they can be. What do we mean by this? Well, let me define the words color glass condensate for you. 
Uh, the word color is easy. Color is just a statement that the gluons carry color. Condensate, I think we can understand now, because what I was doing in that previous picture, I was constructing a phase space density for you. And the phase space density is just dn dy, d2pt, d2xt, which quantum mechanically is just the occupation number of states of a given momentum or energy at, uh, at in, in this box, uh, which has some size v, which is associated with d2x. And the way this works is if you have a condensation phenomenon, you have an attractive potential which causes you to produce particles. But then when you get high enough density, a repulsive interactions cause you to stop adding more particles to the system. And that always happens when the phase space density is of order 1 over alpha strong. And that you've seen in many, many contexts. You've seen that in the context of superconductivity, where you have the Landau-Ginsberg model, and the condensate ends up saturating at some density involving inverse coupling constants. You see it in the Higgs model of vacuum and electroweak theory, where the Higgs condensate saturates at 1 over lambda. It's even true in these atomic traps that the density, if you could keep piling things in, uh, in, in would eventually saturate at some density associated with the inverse strengths of couplings. Okay, so I think we can understand the words condensates. You should also recognize that because the phase space density is very high, that means it's a highly coherent object, and it's probably described by some kind of classical field. Where do we get the word uh, glass? Well, that's where you have to have a little creative imagination. You imagine that you have very high energy hadrons moving very close to the speed of light. They have some very high energy gluons with them, and they make some low energy gluons. Those high energy gluons have their natural time scales Lorentz time dilated because they're moving fast. Therefore, the slow ones which you make have their Lorentz time scales dilated also because they're produced by these fast moving guys. So even though these slow moving folks, which you see in the, uh, in, 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 in the center of mass frame, slow moving means they have a Lorentz gamma factor of order one. They're still moving close to the speed of light. But, but, it, but, but they have their natural time scales of interaction dilated by a gamma factor, which is huge because they're produced by these very fast moving particles. Systems which evolve over very long time scales compared to their natural time scales, I just call a glass, okay? That's sort of the colloquial definition of glass. Glass is a liquid on very long time scales, but it's a solid on short time scales. Mathematically, this also has the property that when you write down a theory of this stuff, the theory you write down is the theory of a spin glass, which involves an incoherent sum over external fields, and that incoherent sum comes about because you, you decohered the system due to long time scale. That's technical details. My definition of glass is just very simple. It's a system which is evolving very slowly compared to natural time scales. Okay, but those of you who um, demand intellectual honesty probably got very upset at what I said in the last few seconds about fast and slow moving because I didn't define for you what was flat, fast and what was slow. By the way, Jesus, oh, okay, um, I hope I didn't do anything, okay, okay. Um, you, you should feel free to ask questions during the talk. I always like people who ask me questions and, and give me a hard time because that makes me at least feel, you know, that I can maybe explain something. Okay. Is everybody with me so far? Everybody's with me so far? No problems? Anyhow, if you... If you oh, it is very important. Oh, that's a very good question. You see, if, 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 if gluons were fermions, the space-based density could only be of order one. But because they're gluons, or bosons, you can get them to be of order one over alpha strong. You can get them to be much larger than one. And that's really important because that's what says that at high energies, hadron wave functions completely dominated by gluons, and fermions are playing a secondary role. Okay. Very good question. Okay, but first, first thing you have to ask is what's fast and what's slow in a hadron, and I said that's sort of arbitrary. Uh, because they said the fast-moving folks make the slow-moving ones. Well, in fact, the picture is a little uh, more complicated. Here's a picture. 
experimental data at RIC where you plot the density of particles as a function basically of the logarithm of the energy of the produced particle from the beam energy. The blue curve is what you get at lower energies. And you see if you go to higher energies, the red curve is there. And it looks just like the blue curve for the fast moving folks. So you might think for the blue curve at this energy, you can make a theory where these degrees of freedom were maybe frozen out and were sources for the low energy degrees of freedom. And then when you wanted to go to a higher energy, you'd maybe have to integrate out degrees of freedom here and turn them into sources, which are now on this red curve, which generates a theory for the low energy degrees of freedom here. And then when you went to yet higher energies, you'd have to integrate out the degrees of freedom here to make the black curve and have a theory which generates the thing at lower energies there. That process is a renormalization group. You're just integrating out the higher energy degrees of freedom to make an effective theory for the lower energy degrees of freedom. And there's a well-defined way to do that, and you can do that from first principles in QCD. And in fact, the surprising thing you find is when you do that, you find a spin glass type theory. And that spin glass theory has a renormalization group which determines the density of, uh, of sources in the system. And that theory has a universal solution. And universal is really important because universal means no matter what hadron you started from, be it a pion, a nucleon, a gold nucleus, or an or, uh, iron nucleus, the matter which you're describing in the high energy limit is universal and it's described by one thing. There's not a color glass condensate which comes from a gold nucleus or color glass condensate which comes from a nucleon or color glass condensate which comes from a pion. It's one and the same object described by the same theory. The order parameter is, in fact, the gluon field itself, okay? Now, now okay, the, 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 the problem is that in order to make the theory gauge invariant for the glass, you have to average overall configurations. And when you average overall configurations, the gluon field density itself vanishes, although the square gets a, a moment. Um, the issue is that in the glass, it's an incoherent sum, okay? It's not a sum with an I, it's an E to the minus something. And that incoherent sum is really telling you you're really summing over individual configurations which have an expectation value. Okay. You know, one can quibble technically over exactly what are the right precise words to call this, but that's what it is. Okay. And the gauge invariance is broken in each configuration, which is restored by the incoherent average. It's like in an ordinary glass. If you look at an ordinary glass which sits on a table, okay, you look at where the atoms are distributed, and, and those atoms are distributed in a way which violates translational invariance. But of course, when you average overall glassy configurations, you'll have a theory which is uh, which uh, has those symmetries restored. But 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 it is a bizarre thing. It's, this is something which is having a local gauge invariance which is almost broken is what this is about. And so you can say, is it really? like a, a local gauge and local, local order parameter. It's not like an ordinary Bose condensate, which really has that order parameter broken, and it stays broken and, and has sort of a, a Goldstone modes associated with the breaking. Okay? Yeah. Anybody else? These are good questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me see. Okay, I, this is just a propaganda slide. Read it, read it fast, okay? It says it's important because it's, uh, because it's universal and that means it's fundamental. That's an advertisement. It's a universal form of matter. I use that because I often give this talk to my nuclear physics friends and they say it can't be matter because it's not thermal or something like that. But to my I, then I ask back, well, if it's not matter, what is it? Pure thought, ideology, God? Yeah, that would really be wonderful. It was one of those things that you discovered in physics. But no, it's just matter. It's just it's just a bunch of gluons which are uh, piled together inside a box. And the number, separation of gluons is small compared to the size of the system. The number of gluons is large. It's just not a system in thermal equilibrium. And it's also a system which is moving very fast, close to the speed of light. Okay? But, but, it, but it's matter. Sure enough, if it runs into you, you will feel pain. Okay? What does a sheet of color glass look like? Here's a sheet of colored glass moving close to the speed of light. Here's what the fields look like. This should look, oops, what did I do? 
This should look familiar to you because if you took Coulomb fields and you boosted them close to the speed of light, you make these fields which look like an electric field in one direction, a magnetic field perpendicular to it, and both perpendicular to the direction of motion. And that happens when you solve the Yang-Mills equations and weak coupling because fields look like Coulomb fields and they just get Lorentz boosted. You can even do it by some fancy mathematics. You let x minus be t minus z, and then you say big components are big if they involve derivatives with respect to this, and small components are things which uh, have, uh, you know, don't have that small derivative in it, et cetera, et cetera. You can do all that. And you find that you're just generating these, uh, these plane polarized electric and magnetic fields. The tricky part is what's the distribution of these things on the sheet in polarization and color? And uh, what, are, what are the fluctuations in that distribution? And it's actually, actually the whole structure of this renormalization group is just determining that functional, which gives this weighting to the system. Uh, yeah? Does this universality extend to the case where you have a large barrier number density? I don't know how I would do that in practice, uh, you know, because or um, yeah. But the problem is that baryon density spread out over, you know, a, it's a good question. Um, You can't do that in the central region at Rick. So you could ask the question, what would happen in the fragmentation region? The problem in the fragmentation region, when I formulate this, I formulate it as a renormalization group problem. So I don't have anything to evolve. I certainly don't have universality in that region. But I wonder if there's a thought experiment what one could construct which would let you make such distribution matter in principle. That I don't know. But as a practical matter, no. Okay, so uh, the color glass condensates explains the growth of gluons of small x. The renormalization group equation, which you solve, actually lets you predict the growth of the saturation momentum as a function of y as a logarithm of 1 over x. And you get this power law behavior. And if you write down and solve those renormalization group equations, you actually get what seems to be seen experimentally within the kinds of errors you can put on that calculation. I've already explained this about how they pile up. Um, but uh, this is kind of remarkable that not only do you find that having this high density gluon lets you solve the problem, but then you can go back and calculate what that high density is and how it depends on energy. It also explains the growth of the total cross section. I'll give you a heuristic argument. Everybody in this audience knows what heuristic is. Oftentimes I, I, I tell people, Heuristic means it's an argument which isn't quite correct, which is what it really means. Okay. Um, but it means I can't fill in the details of this argument. I make an assumption that the density of particles as a function of energy goes like Q saturation squared as a function of Y times the transverse uh, uh, impact parameter distribution, and it factorizes into this form. If it factorizes into this form at large RT, it has to fall exponentially like this. But really proving this is hard. But it's plausible. And anyhow, Heisenberg assumed this about 60 years ago. He used a potential model to get the growth of the cross-section which worked like this. And if Heisenberg did it, I can get away with it, I'm sure. But in any case, this is where the assumption is that it has this form. And to get to measure a, a cross-section in high energy, she takes some probe, which has some typical interaction strength with this, it plows through the distribution. And you just require that the number of particles in encounters is fixed. And that says that this is just equal to constant. Then you, then you work out what this means. This means RT squared goes like Y squared, because RT goes like Y. And that means that RT squared goes like Y squared, goes like the log squared of the energy. And that's known as the force arc bound, which is, in fact, how cross-sections really behave at high energies. So at least you, you, you get consistency with an argument which is qualitative and maybe needs some polishing, but it's pretty good. The color glass condensate also explains features of electron hadron scattering. If you take electrons and you run them into hadrons at very high energies, you have a cross section 
for the scattering of a virtual photon off a proton. And that, in general, will be ten, depend on the Q squared of the virtual photon, the typical momentum of the virtual photon, divided by the saturation momentum squared, because it has to have the right dimensions. But in general, it can also depend on, on, on x. But the dependence on x would say it wouldn't be universal, because that would mean this result would depend upon, say, what energy you started at. And if it's really universal theory and only depends on Q saturation squared, you should have this form without any separate dependence on X. And you can see whether or not that's true by just taking the data for X less than 10 to the minus 2. This is when the gluon density inside of hadrons is really big at high energies. And it works. Okay? In fact, it works too well. It works to higher Q squared than you would think. That's another story to really uh, get to get the higher Q squared stuff to work. You can do that. And in any case, there are worse things than having a theory which works too well. Believe me, I know. Okay, I've had lots of theories which don't work at all. But in any case, it's, it's kind of nice that this works. Okay? And it's, it's a, it just seems to be true. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift gears from talking about the color glass condensate, which are these two sheets of color glass, to what happens when these two sheets of color glass hit one another at the speed of light. Sort of the picture I'm going to have of what happens is, again, in this piece of art, um, what I, what's done here is given the particles you measure at the final time in the collision, you can make radically different assumptions about how the matter thermalizes as you go backward in time, and you get these bounds on what the energy density was. And you can see at a time when you expect the color glass condensate to be important at RIC, your energy density is about 10 to the 30 GeV per cubic Fermi. And this is when, after these collisions, the color glass has formed a glasma, which melts into gluons. Eventually, all the gluons have melted out. The system expands as quarks and gluons, eventually thermalizes and goes to detectors. Time scales here are pretty realistic. There's not much controversy now on what these time scales are. There's actually not much controversy in what these energy scales are. I also marked for your interest energy density in the cores of nuclei, energy density in the cores of neutron stars to convince you that ones at really high energy densities. You go to LHC, it's going to get better. But you're in the ballpark with energy densities and time scales at REC. So what happens? Here's my picture, and I'm going to spend the rest of the talk trying <coughs> got me. Okay, I try, try, I, what, am I doing something wrong with this? Okay, okay. Uh, what, I, what I'll spend the rest of the talk is trying to explain what this picture means. But I'll, I'll give you the 30-second uh, explanation right now. When these two sheets pass through one another, and they're at very high energies, they're very thin sheets, they pass through one another instantaneously. That means the time is the time of passage of these thin sheets. After they pass through one another, they get dusted with color electric and color magnetic charge. Those are the red and blue and yellow dots on this thing. And I couldn't figure out a way of denoting magnetic and electric fields separately. So some of these are color magnetic charges and some are color electric charges. And what happens after this collision is you instantaneously form longitudinal electric and magnetic fields. And you can say, I don't believe that, but then I can stare at you right back in the face and say, you have to. And you say, why? And I say, because the coupling's weak. And you say, so what? And I say, because the coupling's weak, I know everything, and I can really calculate this thing from first principles, and it has to be true. And this has to be true. Okay. There's no cheating. Okay. Well, almost none. Okay. Here's a little bit better picture of what happens. Uh, I'm going to give a seminar on Thursday here uh, for people who want the details about this. But, but basically, the way this happens is you can actually construct the fields which solve this problem. If you have a light cone where one source of charge is on one light cone and another source of charge is on the other light cone, there's a solution where the field is zero in the backward light cone, where it's a pure gauge transformation is zero on either of the side light cones. And then very close to the light cone, if you solve the equations, you'll find that the solution is A1 plus A2 so that you can satisfy the boundary conditions along these light cones. The problem with A1 plus A2 is it isn't a solution to the equations of motion, so things have to evolve in time as you go forward. But that's not important at very early times 
because at very early times, it really is a solution. And then if you look at what that means, you, your mind gets boggled because if you have A1 and A2 there, you have a term A2, say, dot E1, which is the source of charge along this light cone, or A2 dot B1, which is the source of charge here. So infinitesimally, as you go out into the forward light cone, all of a sudden, the topologies change, and you generate longitudinal fields from fields which are purely transverse, and that's totally wild because all I had to do to get you to that conclusion was show you some pictures and some topology, and I didn't even have to solve any equations. And isn't that neat? That's kind of mind-blowing, okay? I, well, I thought it was, maybe you don't, okay. But whatever, hey, um, okay. Now, why is this weird? Well, having both electric and magnetic fields in field theory uh, is actually kind of an interesting situation. Imagine that you have an electric field and an electric charge gets accelerated in that direction, spirals this way around a magnetic field. Now take a, a, a positron. It goes in the opposite direction, but it spirals in the opposite direction. So such fields always will generate a um, vorticity in the fluid. It will prefer certain kinds of chirality. What I've given you there is sort of a 15-second derivation of the tooth anomaly which says these strong fields can produce pulp particles of a particular holicity if they get to be strong enough. So these fields actually do weird things, like locally they violate CP and stuff like that, and parity, and they do funny things to uh, charge. They also are associated with things called anomalies in field theory. In electroweak theory, such an anomaly gener is, perhaps generates the baryon number of the universe through the electroweak anomaly, in QCD, it's associated with the generation of mass, the masses of protons and neutrons, uh, and it's anomalous mass generation. Moreover, and even more bizarre things happens, the interactions of these evaporated gluons with the classical field is really big, because even, those, even if those gluons have weak interaction strength, the gluon field itself is strong, has strength 1 over G, and so it's very strong. So maybe these fields even generate thermalization of the matter in these collisions. Maybe, maybe not. But certainly the, uh, the, uh, the um, structure is interesting. So here's the relationship of, some, of this work to the stuff which Kluger and, and Eisenberg and uh, Svetitsky, Cooper, Matola uh, sort of uh, pioneered uh, a long, long time ago. Man, I didn't know you were that old. Um, but, but the idea was the following. They, they, they postulated that one had an electric field and that that electric field spontaneously decayed by pair production. And they actually solved that problem in a good deal of detail in electrodynamics. Um, in fact, many of the scaling relations they derived in that, that paper actually follow for this, things which relate dimensionful scales one to the other. The constants you can't get, but the dimensionful scales you can. For example, relations between the time scales, energy density scales, and multiplicity all follow from this work. Um, the difference here, the essential difference is that we have a magnetic field. And if you have a magnetic field, d e d t is d cross b. And because there's a non-zero magnetic field in the problem, the electric field can decay classically. And that also works for the decay of the magnetic field. It can also decay classically. So you don't have to have quantum pair production to have these fields evaporate into gluons. It can all happen classically. That said, uh, we didn't quite escape because it was discovered that, in fact, even though you have this nice classical solution of the equations before the collisions, after the collisions, the solution you write down which solves this problem is unstable. Uh, that's good because actually what happens, again, is amusing. The classical solution works to a time of order one of the saturation momentum after the collision, but these small unstable fields are generated by quantum fluctuations around that initial singularity. And in fact, the mathematics which describes those initial fluctuations is analogous to the mathematics which describes, excuse me, Hawking unruh radiation. The growth of the instability generates a turbulence in the system, and that turbulence will have a, a spectrum uh, of scale sizes, which is presumably some kind of Kolmogorov spectrum. 
which is analogous to the Zeldovich spectrum in, in, in cosmology. It will generate fluctuations. Those fluctuations are like what happens in inflation, which at late times become the seeds for galaxy formation. And here they generate fluctuations in the density of the matter distribution produced in collisions, which uh, actually are measured. And you can maybe even hope to describe this in this kind of picture. I found it absolutely amusing, actually, that after trying to escape all of these quantum fluctuations and pair production stuff, which I tried desperately to escape for so, so long, then in the end it came back and bit me on the tail. Right? That you can't get away from it. These solutions actually do have the instabilities. They grow and eventually they become so big they eat up the classical solution. I don't know of any other situation where this happens except in cosmology when one describes inflationary universe cosmology, sort of a similar situation goes on. But it, it, it's kind of neat. Okay, uh, well the key, color glass condensate and the glass made some predictions for Rick. Um, it predicted the total multiplicity. This is an ancient plot. It's not reproduced very well because I wanted to remind you it was ancient. When they first measured the uh, multiplicity, uh, we got it right and almost everybody else got it wrong. And in fact, nobody got it right for the dependence of the multiplicity on the centrality of the collision. Everyone else got sort of too rapid a rise. The reason why this is not rising so rapidly is if you have incoherent scatterings, incoherent scatterings cause a rapid rise as you increase the centrality of the collisions, but coherence cuts this off. Coherence actually works in the direction of reducing the magnitude of the effects you would have from the incoherent scattering case. It makes the system uh, more opaque, if you like. But in any case, one can describe the spectrum of fluctuations quite well in this kind of saturation picture and even more or less get the constants of proportionality right. There was also a test of these ideas um, when one had um, um, tried to describe the distribution of particles in transverse momentum as a function of, say, the X of the nu nucleus which generated them. Remember, we're describing what happens for the smallest X gluons in a, in a nucleus, okay? And so as we go to smaller and smaller X, our approximations become better and better. Now, suppose you take a proton and you try and run it through a nucleus. Classically, you'd say it just multiply scatter and you produce more particles at some PT. Of course, probabilities conserve, so you have to steal particles from low PT to make them at high PT. And at extremely high PT, the kind of typical transverse momentum you get compared to the momentum of the particles is really small. So you characteristically get this kind of behavior. At, uh, at small PT, it's relatively small. It rises, it has a Cronin peak, and then falls down as you go to higher and higher PT. And that's what people had expected. But the saturation of color glass picture says something different. It says you also have to take into account as you go to smaller and smaller values of X or higher and higher energies that the gluons can't quite evolve as, uh, as, as rapidly as you naively thought they would. Because what's happening, you have the saturation scale where all the gluons are packed together um, and you can't put as many down there as you naively thought you could. And what that means is when you solve the evolution equations, you don't make as many gluons as you thought you could because you can't put them into these places where they're really tightly packed together. So that means that the number of the, this curve should fall in magnitude as you go to smaller and smaller values of extra higher and higher energies. And in fact, what were the surprise were these calculations which were done by these folks. Uh, some of the folks who did these things were here. And uh, they found that at low energies, uh, you in fact had this nice cone of peak. You went to higher, higher energies and disappeared. And in fact, on this curve, it happened very rapidly. And of course, uh, what happened was they did the experiment. And here's uh, what happens when you're in the forward region. This is when you have a collision which is uh, not so uh, central. And this is the most central collision. First off, you see that these uh, ratios are less than one, meaning they're suppression, not enhancement. And the other thing you see, which is dramatic, is that in the more central collisions where you would have thought there would have been more scattering out of the beam, there are less particles there. 
and that's due to evolution effects. Oops, what did I do? I did something bad. Okay. You can also see this another way from the Phoenix experiment. In the Phoenix experiment, they can measure things simultaneously in the backward region and the forward region. And if for not so central collisions, they see the Cronin enhancement in the backward direction, particles being scattered out of the beam at low X, and it's at, at high X. And at the central region is sort of kind of about one. In the forward region, not too much is happening here. Things are about one. But now you go to more central collisions. The Cronin peak is really enhanced for the things which are in the fragmentation region of the nucleus. But the small X stuff has really gotten suppressed. Okay. So it looks qualitatively like what you expect in these pictures. Now, of course, the story is that, you know, all the betting was a guinea when you started, okay? But all the bets changed sign after the experiment came out, okay? So, you know, you can, you can make predictions. Predictions are good. They carry some sociological and psychological value. We got it right. Other people got it wrong. Does it mean it's right? I don't know. You know, one, has, one needs more and more tests and refinement. And ultimately, in theoretical physics, you don't show that theories are right. You show they're wrong. Okay? And one can pass a number of tests, and this passes a number of tests, but we'll have to see as things get more and more refined. Uh, I don't know if I really want to go here. I'll go the, here just to this slide, and I'll leave out the mathematical slide, which I'll maybe explain more on Thursday. <clears throat> Actually, I should open this up for questions at this point before I get to that thing. Are there questions at this point? People are reasonably happy? Well, I don't know. Okay, so you can ask the question now. If, if you went to very high energies, you could imagine that there would be two possible cases. That's when all the gluons are packed together and they're sitting on top of one another and the system's completely black and you can't see your way through it because all the gluons are really piled together. And the other situation is where all the gluons are uniformly distributed over the disk of the object, and that's the other phase of the system. And you can ask whether that's true. And the surprise is it does not seem to be true. What actually happens is more bizarre. Actually, at the very, very high momentum scales, very small resolution scales, when the density of particles is small, the gluons clump together in spots. And these spots are highly coherent, if you like, spots of color glass condensate where they're highly coherent. And if you ask what this means for high energy scattering, you will be surprised because you will see that because these things are acting like coherently and they're sitting on top of one another, uh, this doesn't factorize in, 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 in the ordinary sense. The word factorization means if you take a very tiny probe and run it through the system at a very, very high momentum scale, you'll measure the distribution of objects in this thing. And then if you take another probe, okay, you should be able to calculate how that other probe at another scale uh, behaves, for example, a proton or a nucleus. And in fact, there'll be no factorization between a dilute probe like an electron and a dense probe like a proton our nucleus, which has a distribution of spots like this. Another way of saying it is spot spot scattering is not the same thing as taking incoherent gluon gluon scattering. So factorization breaks down, which is one of the sacred cows of, uh, of uh, high energy physics. Um, it's a sacred cow, but it's a sacred cow which you can't prove is true in the small x limit. And what usually happens in physics is when you can't prove something is true, it turns out not to be true. But uh, it's a surprise, and maybe this is the case, and it maybe can have some dramatic consequences for very high energies. It should have uh, dramatic consequences for LHC. Yeah, yeah, that's very high energies. Yeah, that's right. Will you tell us what consequences? No. The, but the the obvious one is you'd have to compare electron hadron scattering with uh, with uh, nucleus nucleus scattering. That would be the simple one, to, the simple one, which is the most direct. And you'd find that the gluon distribution function you'd measure in lepton nucleus scattering would not be the same that you'd measure in hadron nucleus scattering. Nucleus nucleus compared to hadron nucleus is more complicated because you need to know more about the details in a proton relative to that of a nucleus. Okay. This is very, very new, this story. Okay. And uh, 
what its consequences are. It, it does have this consequence. In detail, what it is has not been worked out. Okay. Okay, so I want to finish, uh, finish here and just open it up for questions. Okay. Okay. No, it's not obvious. Um, the, 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 the issue is, I, I, in fact, I, 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 don't, I try to use the word strongly interacting coagulant plasma rather than strongly coupled. Strongly coupled in, field, in this context means that the intrinsic coupling constant of the theory is big. Strongly interacting can mean that there are strong interactions even though the coupling is weak. There are examples of that in physics, a, a, a Coulombic system where you have a nucleus which has a very large Z, even though E is small, Z alpha is big. So when you scatter electrons off a of very highly charged nucleus, the interactions are very strong. So coherence can sometimes generate effects which look strong, even though the intrinsic coupling strength could be weak. Okay. Now the issue of the strongly interacting quark gluon plasma is an issue which is one which is experimentally driven. Okay. Um, there are claims that when you do hydrodynamic calculations of these collisions, that those hydrodynamic calculations will describe the data quite well if you set the viscosity to be small. That said, you're also making very specific assumptions on the initial conditions for those collisions. And if you change those initial conditions, you can compensate for that by adjusting for viscosity. Um, so I, I, you know, I think it is true that it is quite remarkable that the hydrodynamic calculations get you close, okay? The conclusion that it's really strongly interacting or of intermediate strength interaction, what's really driving the dynamics, which gets it close to the hydrodynamic limit, um, I'm a little skeptical of. It may turn out it's okay. If it's true it is strongly coupled. But then it's an empirical fact. It's not being driven by any strong theoretical prejudice one way or the other. And, and, Uh, well, in the glasma, you can't because the glasma is a weakly coupled thing, uh, and it has high, high, high uh, uh, color, color field densities. And you know the color field density goes like one over g squared. Okay, so g is strong. Of course, you won't have that kind of coherence. Um, in in the quark gluon plasma, it's a different story, and and there can be in principle, and that it's it's an interesting question to try to sort that out and, and see what the truth is, uh, and presumably that will happen. Can you title a possible relation between dimension and quantum gravity? Yeah, you want to see? I'll show you. Yeah, you can figure it out. <laughs> the point is that those spots, okay, on that system, okay, those spots can be described by a field phi of x, which is basically logarithm and saturation momentum scale. It's a two-dimensional system. The gradient squared should go like the saturation momentum squared in dimensional grounds. Uh, therefore, the Lagrangian for this theory has to be d2x grad phi squared plus m squared e to the phi. That's a conformal field theory. Okay? However, in order to get the saturation momentum average to be non-zero, you have to add a source into the problem and break the symmetry. Now, you say that's a disastrous thing. But you know what? The funny thing about it is if you break that symmetry in the theory, the theory which started out as a purely conformal theory was only renormalizable theory. And it seems the theory, when you add a source and to break the symmetry, turns it into finite field theory. That's bizarre, because ordinarily that doesn't happen. But it happens here because the infinities of that two-dimensional theory are driven by almost zero modes of the conformal field theory. But it's kind of neat. And, you know, whether, whether this theory of what's happening with these spots is true is much iffier than whether those spots are true. I think those spots are probably true. They really are there. This theory and whether it really describes what, what the, that distribution of spots may or may not be true. But it is kind of interesting that a conformal field theory arises in this context in a nice way, you know, for what, it, for what it's worth. Any other questions? Yes, please. 
Yeah. You can come down here. Yeah, actually, come down. Speak louder, maybe. Actually, if you stand up, it helps. Uh, no, 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 the, the issue is the following. It's in the initial wave function. The initial wave function exists forever, and that's the color glass condensate. And the, in, after the collision, it's glassma. Glassma is not something which is a, glassma is not a glass. Glassma is this sludge which you made from this hot glass. It's like melted glass, if you like. And, and in fact, in fact, when they talk about real glasses, okay, they have a material called a glassman, which is associated with this melted glass. So I, I didn't even really invent, invent the term there. But the glassman really is describing the state after the collision, after the gluons have partially melted. Some of it's coherent, but it's evolving on natural time scales. So what you've done in the collision is somehow you shock the system out of this glassy state. But before it, the time scales really are very much elongated. The, the states which are contributing to the wave function of this hadron are states which have this glassy property. Now, technically, does it have all the properties you get when you really solve for a real glass? Certainly not. But it certainly has the property when you calculate these configurations, the partition function for it is like a spin glass partition function. So mathematically, it has lots of analogies. Look, one of the troubles you get into when you invent new words, which I like to do because it's sort of fun, is when you're inventing new words, you're inventing new words for a new thing, okay? And those new words are, again, like metaphor and like art, okay? They're partly correct, but they're also partly wrong. But if they're successful words, they become words which have a life of their own and a meaning of their own, which supersedes how they were invented, okay? And so, you know, please, give, give me some freedom, some literary and artistic freedom to, you know, we, we need that as physicists. Once in a while, we get to invent a word which is maybe not exactly correct, that catches on and is useful, and this is a useful phrase, and much of the mathematics is kind of analogous and transferable. Okay. Do we have any other questions? That's a good, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. I can, I can tell you. I can tell you what happened. I can tell you what. I, I don't know how the rapidity correlations go, which is part of this, this problem, because we, we don't know the, the theory I wrote down for this is for the correlations in the transverse space. But it is interesting in the transverse space that it appears that the correlation functions at large, at small transverse distances, are given by naive conformal dimensions, which is kind of amusing. But again, the kind of structure you're talking about for intermittency are correlations which are done over rapidity. And this, the theory I wrote down was a theory which is supposed to describe things locally in rapidity. And, you know, one could go beyond this in principle, but it hasn't been done. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, that's what I referred to, your stuff. <laughs> so remember, um, yeah. you were talking about the, um, the instability of a longitudinal field, sure. right? the, the, uh, the plates of glass which have transverse fields we, uh, pass through each other and leave behind the longitudinal field, which then breaks up. Right. Uh, this is really supposed to lead to chaos, turbulence. Well, look, no, 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 what, what happens first, okay, because there's a non-zero E and a non-zero B, that classical longitudinal fields can classically evolve away the transverse fields. Like radiation fields, when you generate radiation from an antenna, you have coherent fields near the antenna and sources, but far away from the antenna, you have just purely transverse fields, okay? That's what happens here, classically. Unfortunately, that solution's not quite correct, okay? Because when you get, when you get to when you look at small perturbations around that naive classical solution, a boost invariant classical solution, you find that non-boost invariant fluctuations grow. And eventually they become as big as the classical field you started with. So the system which was nice and flat in rapidity, in a rapidity distribution looked like this, 
after some time, gets all sorts of wiggles in it. And those wiggles are generated by those unstable modes. So it, in the end, it is quantum fluctuations which are driving the system, but in this bizarre way. It could start off classically, but eventually the quantum fluctuations catch up with it. Weird, huh? Yeah, yeah it is weird. Okay. If there are no other questions, let us thank the speaker.